of either you didn't get what you wanted totally, or you didn't take some of the troops with you, or you maybe not got the result, or maybe you did. And maybe your default is because you've been able to blast through things my way, the highway. But what I want to share with you is the fact that having a flexible style will be massively important. And, and we always say, we've, we massive in big letters in the book, it's never about you. And, and that's where you've got to sometimes ditch the ego. And I see too many leaders all, you know, who are very unique and egotistical about them being so special, and you are, and there's some geniuses listening here who you are special um, and unique, but it's about how you can then flex your character, your style of communication to fit the situation. So this is where we're going to bounce straight on to what we call situational leadership. So for those who aren't familiar with situational leadership, this is, this is again, echoes this sort of framework. It's not about you. Situational leadership is about what you deploy as a style and a character and an energy level based on what is around you. And I think there's, and there's three key big areas where we need to consider um, will, what will determine your approach. So the my way, the highway, that single approach is never going to work. And if we, and actually I'll just coin, I'll look at that a second more. If we look back in history, if you look at leaders of the past, and let's look at some tyrants as well. You look at um, Hitler. It, he could not flex his style. Otherwise, they would, have, they would have won. You know, we'd all be speaking German. You think of people like, let's look at the style of people who have who've fallen out of power in Britain. Maggie Thatcher, classic. Maggie could not flex her style when needed to. And so Maggie's approach was very on a couple of different styles. But had she been able to flex a little bit, we might have had a different result. She might have had a different result. And that's typically what's the, what's the downfall of many leaders. They can't flex the style, and then we don't get the result in the scenario and situation. So let's just consider, <coughs> excuse me, what worked for you and what hasn't worked for you, and what in this current scenario, which is really, it's been a really interesting time, from a, a bit of a geek on research and, and stats, I've been fascinated and I've, I've loved listening to um, managers. And I talked to Carrie, who's on a little while ago, and she said how some people have really stepped up and, and come, on, come into their own, and even team leaders. And, and when I, you'll hear me yourself talk about leadership, and we, we like this leadership culture. We want everyone to be thinking as a leader. And I'll come on to that in a minute, because some of you might be thinking, woof. How can everyone be a leader? But we want to create a leadership culture. And when you do that, those who you might not have, have realized will step up and pop through that, pop through that and do some amazing things that you never even thought. Might be the quiet little mouse who never said boo to a goose. But you'll also see, and I also know that some people have sort of, let's say, crumbled a little bit. And that will be interesting about what has been, what have been some of the factors with that. Was it the factor in the home? Or was it all, or your, or your organisation, or was it factors from external, from the home pressures, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? And that's maybe we want a consideration as well. So situation, uh, situational leadership really will, will be factors with situational leadership should be this: what is the gravitas of the situation? How risky? How what a threat? And how dangerous is it? So that was, should be one of the key things that starts to flash up, what should my style be? And also with that, a time frame of how long have I got to impact on this scenario now? Two, what are your people like who are gonna be dealing with this scenario? So, and, and again, the key things are, are they knowledgeable and skillful enough to deal with the situation? And are they motivated enough, motivated enough and in control of emotions to be able to deal with a situation? Because you can have all the skills in the world and all the knowledge and experience, but if you're not controlling emotions, this emotional intelligence, you're never going to get that result. And we all know that because, you know, we've all lost it emotionally and not got a result we wanted. We, we've all done it. Um, I do it regular. <laughs> and I'm trading this stuff. So... We, we've got to consider how, how, what our people are like, 
And then those two combination factors of the knowledge and skills of your people, the emotional stability and the gravitas of the situation and time frame should then start to determine what style you were approaching it with. So this is why my way, the highway is only going to resonate with a certain amount of situations and it will be totally inappropriate for other situations. And, and I know that some managers out there in a crisis are going to be phenomenal, but when things are nice and calm from a, a, a developing and bringing culture on might not be quite as good. Um, so you've got to think, you know, where are your strengths? Where do you need to, where do you need to fix? So let's just hoist that one in. To what extent, takeaway, have you considered people skills, motivation, knowledge and skills, and the gravitas and, and risk of the scenario, and to what extent have you framework that in your head before you've gone in and deployed your style of leadership on the people around you? Because it should have been critical factors. Now, when we talk about styles, there's a few different things I'm talking about. I'm talking about styles, and I'm talking about pretty much, um, this is, we, we always reference a guy called Daniel Goleman. Uh, Daniel Goleman, read his stuff. If you want to know anything about emotional intelligence, he is, he's the daddy. You know, he was one of the key factors in looking at emotional intelligence. And, and what's interesting is, well, I find it interesting how you do. One of the, one of the key things we, we, we always say to people on our leadership academies, and, and this is a top tip for you, the word emotion. If you want, motive, if you want people moving, look at the word emotion. There's a clue in the word. So the more movement you want out of people, the more emotion you've got to create. Now, at this point, I'm not saying if emotion pain or emotion pleasure. You know, we'll move on both. And, and I've motivated people on both sides or, or you know, loads. Um, previous life, I was very good at motivating with pain. Um, now I, I'm more, you know, now I've grown up a bit. I'm more like, let's, let's motivate in a way that creates pleasure, um, but also have that, that edge there where, we, where there is a consequence and there is pain. And that pain could be intrinsic, as in how is it going to make you feel, or extrinsic, you're going to get sacked. So you will know about, you'll know about motivating, and let's just think about how you're moving your people around. An influence on that will be the character and energy you portray. And I always say, if you are delivering and you are engaging with your teams and people in a blamange way, you're going to get a blamange result. So again, another consideration of your style will be the energy, the motivational pathways you're using to move people. And then it comes down to the words. And basically you'll see on here, Goldman, Goldman sort of came up and, and coined six pretty much styles. And, and I'll just run through them quickly. And they can be used individually, they can be used in combination, and you will flex between these styles based on back on the last slide about the gravitas of the situation, what risk, what's your people motivation, what's the people knowledge and skills, and that should start to determine the energy you portray, the motivational methods, and the style and words you use in leadership. So uh, in, you'll see it in the book, and I'm no doubt many of you have taken it. We, every, everyone does it on the leadership academies. We, do, um, we get you to take one of Goldman's leadership analysis tests. And it's not a pass or fail, anything like that. It just gives you where you lean to. You'll, have, you'll use all of these, but they'll be in different degrees. And what we want to know is what's appropriate? What are you using now that is appropriate or inappropriate? And could you tweak any? So should you use a bit more command? Should you use a bit more democratic, et cetera? And we'll, we'll explain all that. But just in a very brief snapshot, commanding, and remember, it's the word you're using. So I can be commanding. Commanding is direct and tell, more or less. There's no ifs, buts about it. This is what you're doing. But it doesn't mean to say it has to be in a very sharp major routine. It can be done in a very gentle, calm way. If the words dictate there is no leeway, this is what you're doing. I would like you to leave the building now. That is commanding. Okay? Now, what's interesting about this, and me and Sophie always have a giggle about this, is new leaders tend to default to the command. Because when the new team leaders or a new manager, we've all done it, is we tend to think, um, uh, all right, now I'm the boss, I've got to tell everyone what to do. But it, and again, it's the scenario situation should dictate that. And you don't have to. It's just like, I've got to flex those muscles. Um, and maybe not. Maybe it's not the right way. So commanding is an interesting style. Um, and we would use commanding when we've got things like crisis. 
when there isn't time to do anything else, when you've got to lead and take command and just point people in that direction. From my military work days, when on operations, it tended to go, when it was all going down, very command style. Um, so let's, but is it appropriate? If you've got people who are highly motivated, highly knowledgeable, skillful, up for it, coping, maybe we can go more in a style of just let them get on with it. And do I need to command and tell people what to do when they know what to do? <laughs> you know, all you're going to do is pay them off. So maybe not. Pay setting is an interesting one because pay setting, and it's critical in your environment. If you think of the jobs and the stuff you've got to do in the day, and again in crisis when we've got multiple factors to take consideration of, pay setting is about keeping your folk and your staff on track, on pace to get through everything they've got to get through. And if you're not pace setting in your environment, things will um, fill up and block up. So to what extent are you using a pace setting style appropriately? Again, you could be over pace setting. You know, if you don't give people a bit of respite sometimes and no sooner they finish one thing, you're given another 10 things to do and they never see an end to it, you'll demoralize people. Now, I want to take the next two separate, democratic and coaching. Um, democratic is where Best used if, if you've got, and obviously it's a dem democratic, you're asking, you're going into that style of ask. Pace and command can often be a little bit more direct. Democratic and coaching is obviously going to be an ask style, and it's great for the democratic style. It's great if you've got a highly experienced team around you, full of knowledge and skills, you don't know much about it, you might be new in a job, or you've just gone to a new appointment, or whatever, whatever, and you are getting to find out who knows what, and also, getting the experience from your people around you. But again, a number of leaders tend to think, I can't ask people because it'll I'll look undermined, but it's a real strength to do that. You, plus, you'll find out a lot about the guys and girls around you who, know what who wouldn't know what they're up to. Um, but it takes time. And if democratics tend to have meetings for meetings for meetings and nothing ever gets done, and it could be a way of, of, of almost... Um, of abdicating responsibility when things go wrong, where the, the democratic leader has too many meetings and asks everyone what to do. And again, why ask people? If people haven't got a clue what to do, why ask them? You know, you then flip to coaching style. So again, the style, situation, people, knowledge, experience should determine what you're using. The coaching style is at least using your environment, but probably could be the most effective use if you if you can start to learn how to coach. A lot of people think they coach because you ask people nicely. No, you might well be doing command style, but just telling people what to do, but doing it in a nice way. Hey, I'm coaching. It's all that pink and fluffy stuff. No, coaching is about asking and helping people find a pathway. It isn't about telling them what to do. So to what extent do you go into that ask and discovery? And the great thing about the coaching style is you get longevity and development from your people for long term. The interesting thing is you guys are all care. You're all in the care business. You're all about fixing people. So you tend to default back to the, I'm going to have to tell them what to do because I can fix this. And especially when you know you can fix it and you know what the problem is, the, um, the, the risk is sometimes just to say, well, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to go and tell you what to do. So please just try and put the handbrake on that and open up the people from a coaching style and find out what's going on in their map of the world. And this particularly, this coaching style, in a cri not in a crisis, but in the, let's say, lulls of this crisis with the COVID on now, is fantastic for just exploring what is going on in the mind of the person in front of you. Because you'd be surprised how many times you don't read that. And you'll be surprised how many times they will cover things up and block things out when it could sneak under the door and bite them on the backside and then you've got an incident in the home or, or your organization. The uh, affiliative style is one, a great in a crisis. And this is where we go, right, the troops, the team, the people, the home, we're in a bit of a crisis, people are panicking, people aren't gelled, they're getting fragmented, they're not sure what's gonna happen. And this is where the leader jumps in amongst them and gives them that support where I am one of you. I am in there with you. I understand. And this is how we are going to fix it. And it quite often floats around the affiliative style with the visionary and the command. And I'm with you. I'm one of you. And this is where we're going and what we're doing. 
So again, that could be, and, and I want to know how often have you jumped in amongst the troops during this crisis or have you sat back too much in the shiny office thinking I'm just the boss and I'll direct from up here because they may have needed you. Consideration, if you jump in amongst the troops too much, they'll be like, what are you doing here? We want to get on with it. So again, there can be a downside to each one of these if they're overused or inappropriately, okay? And plus the troops might think, oh, well, the boss is just one of us and uh, we'll let, you know, mediocrity will be fine and we don't have to really do that because we're all mates. No, you've got to divide that. Visionary style, probably, you know, a least used but massively important in crisis when troops and, and organization, your carers are a bit worried, is continually pointing out the future where you're going with optimism and, and having them a clear pathway, your vision of where you are going and how you're going to lead them out of this and how that aligns with your values of the business and the care and everything you do will be critical. So to what extent, and that moves, you know, when we can see something, we tend to have a clear vision. We can move towards it a lot easier. But how often have your troops started to feel a little overwhelmed? They couldn't see a clear pathway. They were worried. But, and, have you, and you could have solved that by, one, coaching and democratic and asking them. Two, getting in amongst them. Three, setting a clear pathway. And then maybe saying, we're going to do it with this. Uh, uh, we're go you're going to do it like this, and we're going to do it on this pace. So you can see there's a simple example of using all six styles there. And to what extent have you been able to flex and do what you needed to do? So there's a, a whistle stop through the, 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 the styles. And I just want to emphasize again, it is the words you use in the style, not necessarily trying to be a Martin Luther King and the style you use or a, or a, a blooming drill sergeant being command. It's the words that dictate the style. We've then got to consider your character, charisma, your engagement, your ability to read the people around you. Um, and that is all around emotional intelligence. Read our book. We feature on it a lot. Read um, some of Goldman's work, who is a genius. So what do you use the most of out of that? Um, out of those styles, what do you use the most of? And have you... Do you need to tweak any right now? Are you not getting the right result with certain people or certain scenarios? So ask yourself that now. Is it worth considering changing my style? And are you doing that appropriately for the scenario? So, you know, when we put people through the leadership styles questionnaire and we start reflecting, almost everyone starts to tweak certain you know there'll be a certain styles that you will tweak and they'll sort of say right now i'm going to go on back and look at do a little bit more visionary to keep the keep the home and people or my organization moving in that direction i have got rooms from really experienced motivated staff i'm going to lesser command and go more into the um uh, discussion type um so you just start to tweak um and what i want to say is to what extent does your style impact on the culture and also culture impacts on staff turnover. Fact. So is your style impacting on the culture of your people? And what is the culture of your home? Because I, I often stand up in, in, in events, concerts, <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, I often stand up in events and say, you know, who's a great leader? And I get all sorts of hands going up and I love it. And I love people thinking, now I'm a great leader. I'm good. I like that. And then I say, well, who's got a pretty, you know, let's say caustic culture where we've got a lot of, you know, let's say fragmented teams, a bit of bitching going on here and there and all the rest of it. How often does that happen? And so, oh, I've just got a cup of tea off my mate. Thanks, Sean. And then, and if you've got a caustic culture or the culture's not great, you need to look in a mirror because you're not as great a leader as you think you are, unless you're brand new in post. So what can you do to influence that culture? And so when we look at qualities of leader and you influencing that culture, we always talk about what qualities of a leader, what are the qualities of a leader? So imagine during this crisis now, what were the key qualities you wanted, you, you had to have to get through that crisis? Well, it's dead easy. You needed, sorry, there is a bit of background noise, I do apologize. You needed to have, to be able to keep calm for one, so you could control emotions and think laterally. You needed to be able to think strategically and sideways in a scenario and see what was beyond you. You need to be decisive. You need to be fast problem solver. 
You needed to do all this stuff. That's what great leaders do in scenarios and situations, either in a crisis or not. Now let's flip that. Day one, brand new carer comes into your organization. You have an incident and Mr. Jones falls over and is injured. What qualities do you want out of that brand new carer day one? If you could ideally have it. Being decisive, thinking sideways, understanding consequence implication of what they did. Keeping calm, asking for help when they needed it. All those typical quality things of a leader you want with, your with the guys and girls on the floor. So to what extent are you developing that leadership culture? Because if you do develop a leadership culture and people think like a leader, you get some phenomenal results and things start happening in your home. And when you say to your brand new carer day one, I want you to start thinking like a leader and this is what you're going to do. And the more you develop this, the more we will empower you to be, to be and operate like a leader. We have some added benefits of that. So, so, and the added benefits are, we get, we get a massive amount more of, of engagement. We get a massive amount more of people taking responsibility. We get people stepping up when they need to. We get, we get guys and girls feeling valued more. And, and all that is because even your junior carer feels like they've got a level of responsibility. It aligns with the values of what you're doing. And they know they will be called on. People like to be challenged. So a couple of key things for you as a leader. Create the vision, support people to develop, and challenge them. People, if people aren't challenged, they go stale. And that's why people have said, well, in this current crisis, people have been challenged. God, and I've, I've seen some phenomenal things from some of my staff. They've been challenged, and it will surprise you. So how are you going to go back and shape the culture? How are you going to go in there? And are you doing this effectively enough? And I'm I know lots of you are. So, you know, what I want to do is this. I want to ask you, go and engage. And if you're engaging, ask them what culture they want. Because it's critical that the people in your environment are operating in an environment where they feel where the culture matches this. Because culture is very much linked to values. So what's, what do they want? Because if you start dictating, this is going to be our culture, and these are going to be your values, well, guess what? You're going to lose a lot of people, and it might not align. So ask them, empower them. And when people feel empowered and asked, they're like, wow, I've got an opinion. I can start to shape this. I've got responsibility. And it's amazing how people step up. But it's about ask. And asking with open questions, not leading, and finding out what is in the mind of the people around you. Do you really know what shapes them and what moves and motivates them and what their values are? Or was it construed by the boss on a golf course, this is what our culture and values are and the people haven't bought into it? So you've got to engage first. Secondly, empathize. Respect that we're all different. We will all be moved and shifted in different ways, you know? So how can you respect the fact that people will come things from another angle and have different values and different demands? And to what extent can you accommodate that if it fits and aligns with what you're doing? Empower. I say empower because give them the controls to start to shape. Because if I own my values of where this company's going and I'm a worker, a carer, God, I own this, I own these values, I will police that. And what's really interesting is that when you get this right, amazing things happen because people own the values and the direction and the culture, and they will then start to police it. And I'll come on to that. Energy, you've got to make time for this. Um, it's no point in just writing them on a wall, have a look at that, everyone in favor, yeah, all say aye, and then they're on the wall. And I want you to, you know, perhaps go back to your staff, pick the first staff member you've come across as you go out of this room and say, right, what are our values? And if they know them, fantastic, and then ask them what they mean to them, and then ask them to benchmark out of 10 where you think you rate on them. And this sort of engagement will start to shape how you are leading, how they are seeing you lead, and how you hook up with them. And then give responsibility for enforcing it. And this will happen naturally. If people are empowered, have created the values and the culture, and I call culture statements, don't just have a word, have something that brings it alive. And then what happens is you'll see amazing things. And if they get into it and buy into it, and you've got to 
you've got to highlight key influences in the business. You know, I've done workshops, we've done leadership academies for a number of people on the call today. And, and, and I get them to target the, you know, the, the carer or the team leader to bring on the leadership academy who's going to be an influencer, who's going to be a resistance and create a catalyst for anarchy. I want to flip them and get them on side. That's critical. So it's about that energy to do that and it's about that empowering them because once you start to shape this, what will happen is even the ones you've got resistant and don't want to do change and don't want to shift and don't want to start approaching things with a leadership style themselves, and this should be cascaded uh, through the business, um, they tend to either leave, they don't fit in with a crew, they don't feel part of what they're doing, but the other guys and girls on your teams will start to police it they will suddenly start to pick people up. Oi, Ari, that isn't against our val That's not You're not following our values. It's up here. We will respect each other and have consideration for each other. You're not doing that. And when you start to see, see your team start to police this themselves and challenge others amongst them, you know you've got something fantastic happening. So maybe go and have a play with this culture. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of... So to summarise a couple of these things, how can you go and do that? What is the culture like now? Benchmark it. You know, so a couple of takeaways. Firstly, what is your, what if, how have you been operating during this crisis? And don't look now at the results in where you are. When we review performance with elite athletes and so military and care organizations and outstanding managers, when we've had a scenario, Yes, we'll refer to the result, and it was a good result, a bad result, but then we've got to focus on the performance. What segments of performance went on, and let's refer to those. Because you might have got away with it just, but you might crash and burn next time. Or you might have failed, but what tends to happen is you will, your energy that will be determined by the result, failure or success. Well, actually, we should put that away. We should focus on how we review performance, okay, from a clinical perspective. And that's gotta be created with transparent, a transparent feedback and culture where people feel safe and you create that environment to people to feel safe and to be able to lead and give opinion. So, what's your style? I'm gonna wrap you up in a second, Rob. All right, let me just summarize then. <clears throat> what's your style like? What have you learned from this crisis? What is the culture like and how are you now appropriately shifting your styles in amongst your people? And I'm no doubt you're all doing phenomenal things, but it's what can we do fine margins just to make you that elite manager and take you from good to great. Okay. Awesome. I hope people have picked a few little bits up there. Yeah, um, we've, we've had people sharing um, their leadership <laughs> styles or what they think their leadership style might be in the chat. Um, and we've got a couple of questions come through as well. So what I would say, um, thank you very much for that. Um, one question that we've had is if it would be recorded and sent out. And yes, I will um, tidy up the recording and get it sent out today. So if you do want to share this with anyone in your team or colleagues, then um, you'll be able to do that. <clears throat> I'll do my best to get it out to you as quickly as possible. Um, before we get to the questions, so what I will say is if you do have any questions about maybe what you might be struggling with at the moment or a question that might help your team, um, anything on what we've covered, anything about leadership styles or culture, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, also, say whether you want to me to just read it from the chat or we can always unmute you and have you ask the question be nice to hear some some other voices other than just ours so have a think if you've got any questions drop them in there and we'll come to those in a second um, and what i'll do to start uh, just before we get there is um i'll just tell you a little bit about the giveaway so we realized that we obviously aren't going to be doing any in-person events uh, for a little while um, and as i have a book a uh, box of books behind me which is clogging up my bedroom at the moment and um, we thought we'd do a nice little giveaway um, with with the care leaders handbook so if you don't have a copy or maybe you do have a copy but it might be nice to get an extra copy to give to somebody as a present or someone in your team then all we're asking to you to do is just share something about the workshop on social media so that can be Twitter LinkedIn Facebook and um, we don't mind um, make sure that you tag judgment index um, in it so that we can see it 
and what we will do is we will have a look through them over the weekend and then we will get in touch and grab your address um, to send you a free copy of the book so obviously it's a little plug um, and it helps raise people's uh, you know awareness of us and what we're doing and um, but hopefully you can share something you know maybe something about leadership styles or something that you've thought about culture um, so yeah not very difficult all you need to do is tag us um, on social media and we will kind of, you know, we'll give away. I mean, if everybody on this call does it, then we'll have about 30 books to get into the post. But um, we, we will, um, you know, we're not just giving away one book or two books. We'll give away um, as many books as, as we can. So and um, that's all you need to do. You don't need to put something on every social media platform. You don't need to follow us on every social media platform. If you are on Twitter, put something on Twitter. If you're on Facebook, put something on Facebook. That's all we're, all we're asking. Um, so, right. So let's get on to questions. So we're going to spend, you know, the next sort of 20 minutes or so. Um, just, you know, when we did this uh, the other week, we had some great questions from different team leaders and people that were asking about things that were maybe on their mind at the moment or how to best approach a situation. Um, what I would say is um, if you get your, your questions into the chat, let us know if you want to speak. Um, what, I've got a couple of questions here that I'll ask first, Rob, that I've got written yeah. down. And then when people want to speak, um, just a little Zoom tip for you, if nobody knows this, um, you, you can actually just press your space bar on your keypad. Um, so that space bar will unmute you temporarily. So you could press the space bar to ask your question and then let go of it and it will mute you again. And um, so let me ask Stevie. So Stevie, you had a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and um, ask that? Because that was the first question that came in. Hi, yeah, um, we're doing a lot of work on Teams and Zoom and Skype. I'm isolated here alone. I have been now for 94 days and I think it's really hard for managers to work consistently all the time using those um, platforms yeah. because you don't really see people. You see this sort of dis disembodied head that floats around and you don't see people's actual body language which is such an important thing for a manager to see have you got any tips that you could um, give us as to how to manage this because some of the people i manage are certainly feeling disengaged and not so confident in their work at the moment mm. uh, well let me just say one thing then sophie's the expert on this sort of stuff but just one thing i would say to what extent stevie you can ask more you know and put those little those little golden questions in maybe offline maybe before the odd person you think's a bit wobbly but go into that ask style because quite often we presume we see a we see a character or we, we see someone and we we will presume and we'll be seeing them from our map of the world it might not be their map of the world so all i would say is perhaps a little bit more of a coaching ask style particularly for the people who you suspect are a little vulnerable but so if you better nail this one. Yeah, I, I think mine are probably um, more on tips on if you are doing a lot of Zoom meetings or, you know, various different Zoom team meetings, um, they can become very draining. Um, and they can all you people are starting to get sort of zoom overload <laughs> from being on so many zoom calls And that's exactly why we played music at the start of this to try and give it that different feeling um, You know that it wasn't going to be one of those kind of meetings um, I think an important thing uh, with with zoom is first of all to make sure that any zoom meeting has an agenda and that at the start You tell them this is what we're going to go through um, all of the kind of if it's work related and it's a meeting, then all of the how are you, what's going on, how's your cat, that kind of thing should almost be put aside for a separate social call and trying to um, separate work from a social coffee hour, let's say, or a happy hour <laughs> or something like that um, can be really useful because then it gets the meeting done um, in a short space of time. So just like we did today where we said we're going to do 30 minutes workshop 30 minutes q a then we're going to do is it helps people know exactly what to expect from the zoom call which just helps i think um and another thing to think about is whether everything needs to be a zoom call because a lot of science has been done on the fact that actually um voice 
is a lot better for communicating in terms of could you just say something like right we're gonna have a meeting but it's gonna be quite informal we don't need to be on zoom why doesn't everybody try and get out for a walk and we'll do it as a walking meeting and you don't need to be on camera you can just walk and talk and then we're all getting a bit of fresh air and it's got a different vibe to it and I think trying to break things up like that um, can just help it you know I'm sure a lot of people have endless zoom meetings in their diary and that might that might help differentiate yeah the only problem is that I've, I'm the national manager oh right so I've got people in Newcastle and Penzance <laughs> yeah so you know that that that's really difficult I don't mean walk together but, I mean just walk you know the the call's going to be at four o'clock yeah go and, go and walk around we'll your block or walk to the yeah, park we'll yeah don't necessarily have to be together we also um, tried the other day we tried turning the cameras off yes can really yeah it doesn't always need to be on camera yeah. and I think that's something that a lot of people are starting to realize now so yeah, yeah. <laughs> not everybody wants to be seen Thanks. with covid hair do they <laughs> thank you thank you stevie um thank you. so we did we've got some um questions as well in the chat but let me just come to the next one down yeah. um this one might be a good one for you rob so shan has asked how to motivate and encourage a team to continue to reach the high levels that they've achieved during this time so I think what he's saying is that the team have really sort of excelled themselves and, yeah. and done amazing work, but they're all starting to feel the effects now. And how can you sort of motivate and encourage them to, to continue? Yeah, um, Shan, that's great. And I'm delighted that you treat, you know, the team and the guys and girls have stepped up. Fantastic. I think what I would say is, is I mentioned three words earlier, vision, support, challenge. And that vision support challenge is really interesting to, to you. One, acknowledging and the feedback to them about how well they've done, and you've no doubt done that. Have you done that in an asking style? Have you actually asked them how well they've done? Have you, have you gone into their own minds? Because sometimes when we just tell them, and you're not, you, you care staff alike, they're gonna be, oh yeah, well, the boss always says we're great and all this there. Ask them, get them to repeat it. That creates a, a, a pattern in the brain. So get them, one, to acknowledge it. Two, how can we go now, find margins? And when I said about analyzing performance, this current scenario, um, Sham, when they've, they've developed, what I want you to maybe consider is, yes, you've got a great result, but then start maybe form little innovation groups to break down elements and give responsibility because so again you're giving responsibility and challenge to your people and then ask them what the next level is but i think you should also consider and i'm not saying you know i'm never going to say you don't do this and i've no doubt you do make sure you're building adequate respite recuperation there's been a, we did a whole package and there's some videos out there we did a little while ago or you find it on linkedin what we've done um, about dealing with trauma in these scenarios and about feedback effective in these scenarios and maybe have a look up at have a look at those guys because they'll, be, they'll be they're probably quite useful for engagement with the people in a crisis as well i can link that when i send out all yeah. the information afterwards and is I that think, right shan is that sort of giving you a couple of things buddy yeah i Brilliant. think I think one thing as well with that is, um, you know, if you are having successes at this time, which is hard to think, is this a successful time? But obviously, if the, if the team are stepping up and they're doing a really great job, if there's any way you can kind of capture that, either whether that's thank you notes from families or relatives or things, those sorts of things, any photographs that you can capture so that you could almost maybe create a board somewhere. Like, let's not forget about this time and how we all kind of came together and got through this. You could have some sort of board with the successes of what's, what's been happening in the last few months. That might be quite powerful to look back on. Mm -hmm. Um, at some point in the future. Good. Um, so we've got some other questions. So um, Nikki Richards, hi Nikki. Has I don't know if you're if you want to unmute yourself and ask this, um, or I can ask the question. So Come on, Nikki, where are you? <laughs> you just need to press the space bar on your keyboard to to and hold it down to temporarily temporarily unmute yourself to ask a question. Um, she's not speaking up. I'll ask it. So she said. 
Hi, Sophie. Hi, oh, Rob. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi Nikki. That's I'm, okay. I'm suffering with a dental abscess this morning, so that's oh, why. Oh gosh. I'm because it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> <laughs> I guess for me, one of my challenges is when you've got so many different leaders in the home, we've got leaders from all the heads of departments, you know, within all the teams, is how do I make sure that I respect their leadership styles, that I promote that and encourage that, but also then that all the different styles we've got don't then cause a confusion across the whole team so that we, we blend together so the final focus is all the same. But I don't want lots of mini me's. God help them all. You know, I want them all to bring their own thoughts and ideas and experience to the table. Respect that, but still come out the funnel that the other <coughs> okay. with the same kind of leadership. Get it, Nikki. Um, I think what you what I'm picking up is that you've got people with different characters, and you don't want to sort of uh, undermine that. And that's cool. That's cool. But when you're the, the, you know, when you've hear, heard me talking earlier about the appropriateness of a style in a scenario, your people really should be buying into that because if there's a danger that they will go, well, this is my style and I'm different than her, this is what I'm doing, wrong. You need them to buy into a framework of situational leadership. I will flex my style and change if I need to because it's not about me as team leader in whatever. This is about the scenario, what we've got to achieve, who's in front of me, how can I best shift those people to do what we need them to do to get us a great result? So where I wouldn't, I wouldn't discourage different character and personality and stuff like that, that's cool. I don't give a hoot if they're an introvert, an extrovert, a theorist, reflector, whatever personality they've got, I don't give a hoot. What I want is appropriate leadership energy capacity style when it comes to a situation and that's what your people need to flex to so i would encourage them uh you've got the book nikki we're going to send you another book you know that don't you um encourage them and take them through some some little work about how they can reflect on themselves and and this this theory and framework for situational leadership and that will probably flip a few light bulbs for one or two of them yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. I thought you were still in your I thought you're still in your gym jams, Nikki. I thought that's why you're not putting your camera on. I am in my, I am in my gym jams and I am in bed. <laughs> but I'm also looking a bit dodgy too. Oh bless you. <laughs> oh <laughs> and we've got some good obviously if anybody has any more questions, um feel free, you know, if you don't want to type it in the chat, um feel free now at any point to just unmute yourself and, and ask a question. And we've got some good I don't know if anybody everybody can see the the chat. I know sometimes you have to click on it to, to open it up. We've got some good um things, tips and things in here as well. So um so, so Nikki again has just said about if you if you search for something negative, you end up seeing lots of negative answers, and the brain is the same. If you ask a positive question, you'll get positive answers. So, trying to sort of tap into that um, that positivity, um, and also Jill has said that they have been um, having ten to fifteen minute coffee breaks where everyone stops and just chats about anything except the current situation, and I think that's quite useful as well. Um, one of the questions that I got asked last week from a team leader was how can we, um, how can we support the staff at the moment when as well as COVID, there's a lot of other things going on, you know, in the press at the moment, we've got the black lives matter movement. We've got a lot of different things going on that is probably, you know, weighing heavy on people and you don't always know because they might come into work and just, get on with it, but you don't know what's going on underneath. And I think now is a good time to be having those open conversations with people um, and finding things that you can do that are positive as well, that can celebrate um, things uh, that are important. <clears throat> so can I just add in, I think what is critical from a leadership perspective is that you find time to do this. Don't just do it as ha haphazard. Is it going to happen? Building space and time for those engaging discussions where you are asking and listening and you're not just telling and presuming. And particularly if you've had trauma in your home and organization, it will be hitting people in different ways. Um, look at the stuff we've created. We put a 10 page paper out about dealing with trauma 
uh, in your home and that will be probably and even if you've not had massive trauma in your home there's still some cracking stuff in there to support your engagement and how you going to how you can create these these little scenarios where we've got that engagement and openness with your people um, so any more any have we got any let's have some come on get me on a get me on some big teasers here I'm, I need to, I'm <laughs> yeah we've got time for a few more questions if anybody else has any more questions just feel free to unmute yourself either you know on the screen or hold that space bar down and and jump in oh <laughs> Can you share with me what your biggest one of your biggest challenges has been hello it's liz here hi liz how are you um hey. i've got a bit of a, a specific question about a member of staff actually a new member of staff is that okay yeah yeah so we have a new member of staff who's fairly new to us who um is and we have tried all sorts of different ways to um to engage with her and um and get her we're in we're in domiciliary care to get her to engage with the clients and it's really hard trying her trying to change her mindset and we have tried in numerous ways um encouragement and and working shadowing etc etc and she's got this she gets the, the the physical personal care is pretty good but her approach to the clients in their their home is really hard and it's getting to the point now where she's you know she's actually making some not enemies is the wrong word but being barred from clients homes because of her approach to the point where we're, we're almost going to have to she's still in her probation we've extended that we're going to have to um let her go because it won't be you know she won't be able to see anyone and i'm we're in a real quandary because it's it just feels i hate taking that that, that end yeah. result because it just feels like we failed but I'm really struggling to find a way forward with how, and it's, you know, <laughs> how we, we change that mindset. It, it's a hard one. Um, it's a hard one, Liz. And our, our, what I will say is she sounds like she's a very task orientated person who will crash through the job and get it done, but probably lacks that element of people skill, like you're saying, that engagement, that tolerance, that, that emotional intelligence to connect. And yes, I would say that's right. And, and one of the key things, one of the things you might well be doing is just telling her what to do. So try an approach of maybe try a, a last ditch approach of asking her how she feels she impacts. Go in a coaching style of ask. Ask her what she really wants. To what extent does it mean to her that the clients and residents she looks after have a good in relationship with her? And then ask her what she can do to change that and just put one or two little things in place. However, I will say. You, I know you, what you're going to say. You will get to a point, Liz, where I will invest in people for so far. And if they don't pass that return of investment, chop them. All right. But it's how your performance manage that. And, it, and, and I have no qualms. I'm not going to have anyone risk the business and our reputation and brand because they can't flip. I always see it as a failure when I can't flip someone and develop them because I fail then as a coach. But you've got to go sometimes a bit hardball on this. Did they come back? Have they done it? Haven't they done it? Will they not change and develop? If they won't, well, hasta la vista, baby, you know? I think we can see some nodding heads, so I think quite a few people agree with that. And I'm um, nodding, he sacks them every week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I have to say, I, yeah, I completely get that, but I just want to be absolutely sure, thank you, that we, we have approached it in the right way. And um, and we fit, it's such a roller coaster. We feel we've achieved something, and we think, oh, you know, we're doing it. And then, and then you know, we get another report, and it's like head to brick yeah. wall type yeah. situation all the time. Let me just add something in, Liz, and, and this isn't just a plug in the judgment index, but at, at your initial interview, when people are taking people on, the JI is a phenomenal tool for uncovering those things. And we would have uncovered that this lady or guy, whoever he is, was probably task orientated and lacked compassion and care and ability to engage. And that's what you can then tease out at the interview and then make a rational decision is are they worth the risk? Can we change them, or is this just going to be too much? Now, maybe um, not for us. And um, good comment, good comment in the chat as well from Lucy. Just 
kind of refre- re- you know um, backing that up just saying you know if they're if they're not ready to move that mindset forward then it probably won't happen and I think mm. the nods from everyone sort of confirmed that we've all probably all had situations all, yeah. all <laughs> time um, and we've got a question here from Kirsten who says and um, if you have a member I, I, I don't know if this is fairly similar but if you have a member of staff who constantly attempts to break boundaries how do you deal with it Boundaries, Kirsten, as in, um, as in a maverick doing their own thing, or yes, yeah. Well, again, we might have picked that maverick out for you. <laughs> However, Kirsten, all I would say is that you've got to contract them tough. You know, engage with them, ask them what they, and, and again, are you just telling them, or or your style of engagement with the person? You need them to repeat. You need them to have that rational mind that we, I know, that you know, and they know, and they know you know, these are the boundaries and the standards and the qualities. And you need them to share with you the consequence and benefit of stepping beyond that. So they know, they are absolutely clear, if they do the maverick thing and do their own thing, Kirsten, that they are very aware what the consequence will be. Yeah. I do I do think an important part of this as well with particularly with new staff can this can play into their induction so um, if you've got staff and, and something that I've heard a lot of people say is that they have someone on their team that will do something and then they'll say, oh, but we did it this way in my last place. And so they almost feel like they know a better way of doing things. And I, I guess the question is, do they ever have a, a valid point? And, and sometimes are you doing things a certain way just because that's the way we've always done it? Um, and I think one of the things that we do have in the book when we talk about induction towards the, towards the end of the book is about feedback going both ways. So not just about you giving feedback to the new member of staff, but about them coming and giving feedback to you. And when they're new is the critical time to do this because if you wait for six months, they'll have forgotten the things that they noticed when they first started. Um, Being able to tap into that in the first few weeks and say, how was the recruitment process? Did we get back to you in time? Did you feel like we communicated well to you? On your first day, did you feel like you knew what was gonna happen? Did, could we have done something better? Capturing all of that from somebody who's new doesn't just help you make changes that might be really, you know, really good changes, but it also helps them to feel that they can communicate and that, that you know, it's, we talk sometimes about leadership, you know, can go top down, but it can also go, come bottom up as well. And, and they will start to feel that their opinion's valued. Um, and that might, that might, uh, might help as well. Um, Sorry, Sophie, it's Kerry. Um, hi, Kerry. Hi, I think if you have a real maverick, you it's almost looking at what they're doing to the wider circle of people. And sometimes, I mean, I'm with Rob and I can be quite hard and say that this person is so disruptive. Um, we had a nurse who was a real maverick and I actually suggested she went and worked for the NHS, <laughs> which she did because she was like, it was like throwing a hand grenade into the unit every single time she was on duty. It was awful. Um, and sometimes you have to encourage people to work for the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did, Gary. Any, so if any more questions, because I've got something, if we haven't got any more burners. We've got no more questions in the chat. So, so yeah, maybe we, ask... we wrap it up in a second, but I yeah, know. she's got something. I just want I know a point you want from to... someone, somebody we've been working with. Simon, I can see you there. I can see how you. Simon, may, I don't know if, and I am prim, I am prompted Simon on this, but <laughs> I'd be really honest here, and I value what you do, Simon, and know, you know how you operate. And what have you picked up over the last couple of years, and, and how have things been changing with some of these styles? Because I know we've been doing, you know, have you got any any way you might share some of the sort of key gems that have, have that you've found that have been happening with your people, and what have your wins been? Yeah, I, I, it's been really interesting. I think the last 10 weeks have, have been challenging for everybody. I think working remotely, I think we've all learned a lesson on how to adapt your style because you can't see how people are reacting and it's easy to, to chuck stuff people's way without understanding their load and understanding. So I think that's a key learning. Um, for me, it was funny the other day, actually, we had a, an ops call because we were just going to get all of our risk assessments to, for reopening our homes um, over the next couple of weeks, and obviously it needs military precision to make sure we don't get an outbreak. And I did quote on the call, I said there are some very 
idealistic people to very realistic people on this call because it wasn't it wasn't going in a direction we perhaps wanted so i think for me quoting i always use that as a real key influencer when i'm having discussions as a wider group so i think on that call you had remember you did the session with us where you had our quality deck director was very realistic i'm the same as same scale as you if i remember rightly somebody that's fairly idealistic and actually our viewpoint on opening the homes was fairly different. So I think all for me, always coming back to, especially working you remotely and you're working as a team, yeah. that you're really identifying to each other's styles because otherwise it can get you very frustrated and you don't get yeah. to get help. Great point, Sam. And again, that's about having empathy amongst your team leaders and the people you're working with. Creating that cohesion and empathy and understanding so if people feel comfortable and that the communication can be transparent and safe without egos getting in the way. It's about respect and understanding. Um, and, we, and we've all, and to be honest with you, Rob, we've had a bit of fun with it. Yeah, you, of course. Let's you know, have well, a bit of Life's just that's, serious. Absolutely. You just go, that's a massively. I like, just want to share. Lucy was up now. <laughs> we go to that music, you know. Just, yeah, yeah. Girls crazy. So, <laughs> so. Yeah, Trev. Okay. Well, I think we're we're obviously busting time now, and I know that people have probably got um other things that they need to be getting on with. So, um, yeah, it's been really nice to have everyone here. Hopefully, we've shared um some useful things, whether it's about the leadership styles, whether it's about the culture. Maybe it's from one of the questions that that came through. Um, that you can go away and just go and try and put into practice. I think thinking about your leadership style is certainly something that you can go and do this afternoon when you have a handover meeting or something like that, or you have to have a conversation with somebody on a one-to-one -one level. Um, we will get out all the information. So I'll include obviously the meeting, the meeting so people can watch it back. And um, the trauma guide that we wrote um, a little while ago, just in case people are dealing with um, a lot of trauma and, and death within their home or company. Um, and I'll throw in just some information about some of the leadership work that we do um, and a bit about the judgment index as well. Some nice comments in the chat um, about, about people that have worked with us. So that's really, really kind of you. Um, and don't forget, there's no catch to this. We will send you a free book. Um, all, really? all we'd like <laughs> something nice, um, something nice on social media. And don't forget to, to tag <laughs> us. Um, and we'll go through them over the weekend and we will, we will get in touch and grab your address so we can get a book out to you. So if you've already got one, feel free. Um, you know, we can send it to someone else. Um, not a problem. Hey. Anything well, thanks, final everyone. to add? <sighs> no, stay safe, everyone. It's been lovely seeing you all. And um, you know it's been frustrating that we haven't been out in amongst the clients and seeing the guys and girls we work with regular. But hopefully we'll catch up uh, on the other side. But uh, we are here. And every one of you, reach out if you need us. You know we're just loving, giving and caring and sharing here. So um, just reach out. We're there for you. So and if you've you. got any ideas, if there's another topic that you want us to cover at some point in the future, then let us know. You know, we've been a bit quiet because we were conscious how busy everybody must be. But we, you know, we decided to run this after the one last week went well. And um, yeah, so we're happy to do another one. If anybody's got a specific topic they want us to cover, we, we can do that. No problem. Yeah. Hey. Okay. They're all there still. Look at them all. Everyone's still there. <laughs> <laughs> I need hey to figure guys. out how to um, end too, the so. meeting now. Thanks. Really nice <laughs> to care. see some of your faces as well. <laughs> Bye now. Well, Bye. Not so much Simons. <laughs> <laughs> Love you as always. Take see you, everyone.